Uh, once upon a time, I lived in Africa working as a journalist and teaching journalism to people living in conflict zones and very difficult parts. I was doing this so that my students could tell the world what was going on in cases of atrocity and also that they could have a career to support their families through the media training. During this time, I found myself in the northeastern part of DR Congo uh, during one of the periods of escalation and violence. Uh, it was a hope and expectation of mine that by bringing these photos to the world, they would reach people who could potentially stop the killing or help stop the killing and bring in an air of peace. One of the duties of journalism is to report the facts and then the public will do with the information what it will. However, kind of a, a frustration I had was that the tropes of journalistic storytelling could never really convey the, the terror of the place or what it feels like when people are just constantly under the stress of having their lives almost ended. So one of the horrible things about war is landmines. Uh, this is a landmine. Actually, no, it's, it's a replica. This is called an anti-personnel mine. And the military logic of this is that when it explodes, it maims rather than kills the soldier. And then at least two of the soldier's comrades will have to drag that person off to receive medical attention. And then this creates kind of further terror while costing military resources. I want to pass it around. Uh, so as you can see, these are prevalent all around the world, and long after the conflict ends, uh, the mines remain active. There's no way to turn them off. So this means that women, children, and men who are f largely farmers but going about their lives, when they step on one, um, they lose at least a limb and possibly their lives. So um, I kind of mentioned the frustration that the journalistic tropes don't convey what, what things feel like to be in these areas. So um, after I got out of... Congo, I started to write short films to kind of explore what it was like to be there because the duty of a filmmaker is to bring the audience into the world of the characters. And so I thought if audience members could come into the world, then they would have a better sense of empathy um, towards what it's like to actually be in these places. And perhaps we could do what I came to call closing the empathy gap. So uh, an idea I had was to use science fiction as a genre to hopefully inspire people to work on new solutions to the landmine problem in a similar way that Star Trek inspired a whole generation of innovators through, that, through its use of technology. And so one of these amazing things in the world is an organization called Apopo. And Apopo is founded by a Belgian Buddhist product designer who grew up loving rats. And at a certain point in his life, he started to train rats to find landmines. And so for 20 some odd years, this organization has been clearing minefields with the use of the giant African pouch rat. This is all true, it's amazing. And so I, I was like, oh, that would, be, that would be kind of a fascinating short film about a rat. And then I was kind of looking for a plot though, right? It's gotta be a movie. And around this time, I was asked to be a judge on this thing called the Robot Film Festival. And the Robot Film Festival is a kind of fun, quirky, event, but it's basically trying to showcase benevolent human-machine relationships through the use of cinema. So like one of the slogans of the film festival is like, what if Skynet loved us, right? It'd be an entirely different Terminator series. But then when I was a judge on this, I was like, wait a minute, if, if ro robots and humans are working together, what if rats and robots could work together? So with that, voila, I had my plot. A love story between a rat and a robot who guide humans out of a landmine field after they've gone insane. Perfect, perfect short film thing, right? Um, so I, I was making the film, and it was getting this great community, and uh, it, people started to kind of become involved in landmine removal work and kind of educating themselves. And then while we had this kind of little barely functioning robot type thing on set, I got kind of interested in the metaphor of like, what if robots are kind of like puppets that you throw electronics on, right? Like what if they have that kind of magic? So then, just kind of as a you know, side quest, as I do, um, I started to try and make the robot from my movie in the real world. In the process of doing this, I came across this fantastic thing, which many of you are probably aware of, but if you're not, called the maker community. And basically, makers are people who are interested in technology, who strongly believe in open source collaboration, and also in like showcasing their projects. So it's all about sharing, high five you, Go, go team. Um, this is also seminal in a lot of the, the STEAM education initiatives you see coming around America these days. So anyway, there I was. I was in LA and trying to make a robot. So I found some makers. And this is kind of, kind of some of what the community looks like and what it does. So I was actually kind of getting OK at this. And another cool thing that's actually enabling the maker movement is that a lot of the technology 
um, that previously in like the very, very recent history would have required advanced degrees in order to utilize is now really available. So someone like me who's like, you know, I want to make a robot um, can actually make a robot. <laughs> So I was I was on cloud nine, you know, you just you feel like a, a non-evil Dr. Frankenstein, right? Like, oh, it lives. Um, so right, things are going great. I got the robot, and then I start mixing the robot with the rats because I'm like, well, it worked in the movie. Why can't it work in reality? So um, I started kind of playing with rats, and they're just amazing creatures. Like, check them out. Um, and when I started, but kind of what happened here is when I started to mix the rat and the robot together, while this rat would be very loving and you can put it on your shoulder and it eats food, when I put the food in the robot, the rat would just jack the robot. It was the first, I think, rat on robot mugging witnessed by a human. And you know, I was like, okay, you know, I learned a lot, you know, just... It's not there. So I was kind of like moving away from my dream of the rat and the robot working together. When I got one of those like chance emails like, hey, McGregor, that you should go check this guy out uh, to see a lecture by a roboticist and artist named Ian Ingram. Um, Ian Ingram makes robots that communicate and commune with animals in nature. Uh, what you have featured here is his work called Lizardless Legs. And the robot is on the left. And so basically, there's a certain species of lizard that does push-ups to declare dominance on the hot spots of the rock. And that robot emulates the gesture that the lizard perceives as I'm the dominant man on the rock, or she-man, or she-she, whatever the lizard genders are. And then the lizard will run away. And so it does this all autonomously. So I went to go see his lecture. I got there at the end. I was like really excited to find someone else who would kind of be interested in this stuff. And I got there, and I was like blathering. And he, he looked at me kind of bemused, and he hands me GPS coordinates. He's like, all right, tomorrow I'll be with my robot lizard come to these GPS coordinates. So now I'm not saying to always follow GPS coordinates to a man with a robotic lizard in some locale unknown, but it's a worldview I strongly endorse. So I met him, saw the lizard, and I was just like completely enthralled. And then I went into what I call the Kung Fu modality of life. And that's basically when you find the master, uh, you just go and offer to be the assistant in his dojo until he teaches you the sacred things. Uh, so I started bugging Ian to <laughs> let me be his assistant, and eventually he graciously allowed me, and I started working on him repairing this robot. Uh, this is a robotic squirrel that scans the environment for humans or dogs, and when it finds one, it flicks that squirrel tail, and in the squirrel kind of lexicon, if you want to call it that, or language, that means head to the trees, there's danger. So once I started kind of working on the squirrel, I was like, whoa, man. And I was also now in conversation with one of the world's foremost experts on, you know, robot animal communication. And the more I talked to him, the more he just made it really palpably clear that my dream of rats and robots working together wasn't going to be. But I was, I was with him, so it's like, there must be something, some way to kind of make this all happen. And so Ian got me into this kind of philosopher-biologist named Jakob von Uxkull. And Jakob von Uxkull is one of the, the founders of a, a field called biosemiotics. He's an inventor of a concept called the Umwelt. And basically what the Umwelt is, is a description that organisms and different species have relationships to each other based on what they can perceive. Um, and so in, in terms of thinking like, how can one communicate with a rat, the Umwelt in his work would be pretty seminal. So one of his famous studies is about a animal that's probably not near and dear to our hearts, but it's eaten you or someone you love in your life. And it's blind, deaf, and can barely move. And I find that amazing. I'm obviously talking about the tick. So Uxkull did a study on the ticks. And basically, the tick has very few ways to perceive the world. So if you think of like all the vast you know, spectrums of sound and UV and ultraviolet and da-da-da-da, how is a tick able to get onto you? It, it doesn't have eyes. So basically how the tick works is it has general light sensitivity in its skin, and that lets it climb to the top, the top of grass. And then once it's on the top of grass, it just waits um, for something to come by. And how it knows something is come, or it waits for a mammal to come by, because all mammals emit something called butyric acid from their skin. And so once the tick detects butyric acid, then the tick immediately drops. And if the tick drops and senses heat, uh, all mammal blood runs at 98.6 degrees. Uh, the tick will then climb up, uh, find a spot with not too much hair, 
suck blood, have a meal, and then it drops off, reproduces, and dies. That's it's got that lifestyle going. So anyway, so I was around of so, but this kind of this like opened up my world, right? Like, so can you can think of like other ways that animal animal perceptions can be really readily integrated into electronics projects. You have hawks that have kind of a, a telephoto lens. Vipers are able to hunt in complete darkness using infrared. And of course, there's kind of the classic example of the bat. But all of these sensors are really affordable and they're really available. And like particularly with the way the maker community has worked with them, um, it, was, it was like, oh, there's a possibility here. All right, so we had our, we had our philosophy. And then, but how are we gonna connect the umwelt of a human with the umwelt of a rat? So as you probably noticed as a human, you're a, a visual creature. Uh, humans' um, umwelt is mostly, mostly visual. However, rats are mostly olfactory. It's through sense. So for example, if a rat comes into a rat convention, the rat knows like who's having sex with who, who's eaten last, who's hungry, who needs food, you know, who wants to have a family, you know, who doesn't want to have a All this stuff is just immediately apparent to the rat. And you can kind of wonder what the sense of time would even be like that, right? When social relationships are all known in the present. So it's, it's a fun thought experiment. But how, how do you connect these two creatures? And so the brilliant insight Ian came up with was to put uh, an accelerometer, which is something that detects motion. It's in all smartphones on the rat in an adorable waistcoat. Well, the adorable waistcoat was my idea. But then when the rat, which, one more bit of information. So the Apopo organization that trains the rest to find landmines, trains them to scratch and on the ground when they find a landmine. So in doing this, it's a part of the natural behavior of the rat that a human can also visually identify with its umwelt. So in order to kind of facilitate the rat to human umwelt communication, uh, we started making accelerometer waistcoat devices and putting it on the rat, and then that would send out XYZ uh, data that is then leading me to my next little phase of life, uh, which is as a rat bionics researcher. So now we had our idea, we had kind of our methodology, and we had some technology, and we had been in touch with the Apopo organization about potential ways that automating the the perception of the rat indication on a landmine could be of service to their fantastic landmine system. And so he and I did the next logical thing and flew to Tanzania to test it all out. Um, this is the Apopo landmine training facility in beautiful Morogoro, Tanzania. Um, you can kind of see those little markers there, but this is just acres and acres full of deactivated landmines where they put the rats to this kind of uh, rigorous behavioral training kind of from birth into when they are capable of going to minefields and shipped off to Cambodia and places like that. Uh, so once Ian and I were there, uh, we started, that's Ian, uh, we, we started to like test this all out and then, <coughs> excuse me, and, that, and that's what the, the waistcoat and the rat. And then, so this is, what happened is uh, we were kind of testing our theories and things like this and this is what the data looks like when it comes out of the rat's weight, waistcoat. And so at this point it became quite obvious that like no human can really draw out what that is. You remember the tick I described out, it had the three factors. So we now need to use a machine learning algorithm that kind of has the brilliance of the tick that can find three factors in the XYZ data here that indicates that the rat has found a landmine, which brings us to our next challenge of actually, yeah, using the machine learning algorithms to do all this. So I wanna kind of take it briefly back to just note that a simple screenplay has now led to the sensory experience of a trained rat being translated by wearable technology that is then interpreted by machine learning algorithms all to work towards reading the world of landmines so the children don't have to grow up in fear of the ground beneath their feet. And that's where we're at now, and I predict a bold and wonderful future for um, you know, bionic rat communication technology. And I want to bring this back one further step to remind you all that this started with a robot and a rat. And if there's something that you can take from my story, I want you to explore the barriers within you to serve as the foundation to forge the bridge to other communities in the world. Uh, because you never know where those bridges are coming from or where they're going or how far they'll take you. Thank you. Thank you.